Mr. Altizer. What's up? I noticed that you have a deer on your shirt. Sure do. And one would think if you have a deer on your shirt, probably means you probably care about the species that you're representing, correct? It's a true statement, I care a great deal. With that being said, would one think by killing that animal, would it be healthy for that animal? You wouldn't think so when you say it, but honestly, oftentimes the best thing you can do for the white-tailed deer is to kill white-tailed deer. Yes, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Absolutely. Is why should you be killing harvesting whatever word you want to use white-tailed deer absolutely yes so let's dive right on into it yeah white-tailed deer are my favorite animal <laughs> there's no question about that. on planet earth far and away i work very hard i invest a great so, yeah. deal of myself to create an environment in which these animals can express their full potential mm -hmm. to be healthy and to thrive <laughs> but as backwards as it sounds sometimes oftentimes the best thing i can do for the species as a whole is to shoot individual animals within that species yeah. and i think a good our first topic to illustrate that the, the reasons why you should be shooting deer is habitat oh yeah Food, water, cover space. Deer need food, water, cover space. And when you have too many deer exceeding the biological carrying capacity on your property, those animals are going to suffer. Mm -hmm. They're going to eat themselves out of house and home. And by all, you can... <laughs> Yeah. There's a you can we can argue percentages and how many pounds of food a deer needs to eat per day, but it's a lot. Six yes. to eight percent of its body weight, eight to ten pounds of dry weight forage every single day. That deer yep. needs to eat from January one to December thirty first to yep. express its full potential. And if it doesn't hit that mark, that animal is going to be stressed and it's going to suffer. Oh yeah, you mentioned carrying capacity, yes. and a lot of we we say that term just very freely. Right. But a lot of people don't know what that is, and what that is is how much a habitat can withstand a deer population and since we're talking about deer yeah that is very crucial when you manage white-tailed deer it, whether you're a professional manager or just a, a you know just a, a person driving down the road in a suburban area and you see all these deer yeah all that means something to you it should at least oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah absolutely and deer they're they're a hard animal to read their health because if you see an animal in the suburbs browsing in a mowed yard you think oh well it's fine yeah. Deer are adaptable that way. They almost, they almost undo mm -hmm. themselves in that way because they're so adaptable yeah. and they can survive. But there's a difference in surviving and thriving. Yes. And one thing, too, we discuss quite a bit, you know, cover to equals food and etc. cetera. But, um, you know, you mentioned 8 to 10 pounds of food per day. Yeah. And we have to remember, a lot of us forget about that. I, I occasionally do. There's primary, secondary, and starvation plants. Just right. because a deer is eating something doesn't necessarily mean it's the primary food sources. And when you have that higher population of white-tailed deer, who's eating the best groceries? Right. The, the dominant, dominant deer. deer. Yeah. So that's why we have to control the numbers. It's a numbers game, is it not? Right. We want to have an adequate number of groceries for all the deer on the landscape so all deer can be consuming those high protein, yeah. easily digestible foods, not just the dominant deer getting the goods and everything else is getting what's left yeah. over. And when we talk about habitat, you mentioned it quite a bit here, is we're, we're talking white-tailed deer when it comes to habitat, but isn't there other species because of the deer population is too high and the habitat starts to st suffer? What other wildlife, you know, wildlife is going to take a backseat to that too as well? Oh, for sure. Yeah, deer... If, if you don't keep numbers in check, deer can eat themselves out of house and home. Yes. And it, that applies to all wildlife within an environment, within your property or within the habitat in which those deer live. When you have deer over browsing those preferred species, the less desirable species are what's going to take over. Yeah. And as a result, I mean, not just deer don't just need green briar. Other mm -hmm. bird species rely on green briar. Yep. Turkeys rely on green briar. Rough yep. grouse, quail, all these animals on your property, they utilize the same... Mm -hmm. space, the same habitat, the same food, yeah. the same water, the same cover as those deer do. So when you have deer eating themselves out of house and home, it's going to stress other wildlife as yeah. a result. Yeah, not even in just the, the food aspect of it, which that's kind of where we're heading, but just the quality nesting, you know, mm -hmm. the disturbance and the quality nesting of uh, cover species 
that a turkey, a grouse, or quail, et cetera, ground nesting birds all together. Yeah. And the disturbance of that, it's just a trickle down effect when you have that. Yeah, and another point I think to kind of piggyback on that is when you have deer stressing habitat too much, then you create more work for yourself or more problems to the habitat in this flush of invasive species. Oh yeah. Because deer, the, the thing about native vegetation, native plant species and communities, they're, they're in the seed bank, like they're mm -hmm. there, and they can do a good job competing. Yes. But if they're getting browsed every single day, eaten down to nothing by deer, because deer obviously prefer native vegetation yeah. over non-native invasive species, you know, you get your goldenrod, your green briar, your pokeweed, all those beneficial weeds that mm -hmm. we talk about, if they get browsed down to the dirt, then autumn olive, Barberry, multifloral rose, Alanthus, all those non native invasive species are going to take up that space because mm -hmm. they're less preferred by deer. Yeah. And then if you see deer eating, autumn olive tree of heaven then that should be a, that should be a problem i mean you yeah. should recognize as that as a problem yeah and then when you throw in the, the protein levels like we discussed just briefly if a deer doesn't get what 18 months up to 18 months of age yeah if it doesn't get a certain amount of protein on a daily basis just because it was going to be uh, genetically a uh, 160 at four it's not going to re reach 160 at four Right. Because of that early stage, it's just like the human factor that when it's born on up to a certain age yeah. is when it's developing. Yeah. So that is very crucial, is it not? Yeah, that, that muscular and skeletal development is critical for a whitetail, especially in the first 18 months, but they're developing yeah. the muscular and skeletal system up until they're four years old. Yeah. Everything for a buck anyway, after that goes to antler development. So anything you can, all those resources that go into the animal mm -hmm. in that early stage of life is going to set it up for success for a healthy rest of its life. Yeah. So and how do you solve a lot of these problems? By harvesting deer, getting, getting that number buck to doe ratio, getting that population at a normal sustainable for the habitat itself because yeah. a population on x property doesn't mean it's going to be the same amount on you know b property okay right. so it depends on the quality of habitat yeah got a hypothetical question for you for our next point excellent say i've got a piece of property and the biological carrying capacity is 10 deer excellent say i shoot seven of them yes there's Those three left <laughs> correct <laughs> you are right so far <laughs> i shoot seven what's going to happen to those three deer left over they are going to reach their full potential. Right. Reason why is because of stress, stress, stress. Yeah. What is stress? Stress is having um, more availability of food and all that stuff. You know, just, yeah. yeah, it's groceries, extra groceries. It's not just like there's a whole bunch of us and we're all standing close together. Why is everyone standing next to me? You right. know, it's just, it's all stress. Stress, yeah. stress dictates antler development, milk production, etc etc and when you have 10 and you take away seven they're going to reach their full potential potential yeah oh because there's so much out there for them absolutely, absolutely. and one example let's take ehd something none of us like to talk about right. because it affects when it's in your area it affects everybody yeah. you know um but let's look at the flip side of that coin of EHD. And mm -hmm. I know in Ohio right now, this time of year, it affects, you know, late August, September is when we start having EHD, you know, people calling in and stuff like that. And I know in Ohio, we are getting those phone calls. It is yeah. far from 2012 where it's just devastation, but we are getting those phone calls. We have to take spleen samples and all this other stuff. But let's look again, let's look at the flip side of that coin. When we do have an outbreak of EHD, Half full, half empty. Mm -hmm. Sure. When we do have an outbreak at EHD, you're taking away seven and leaving three. Yeah. And what happens again? We just explained it. You're reaching those potential. I mean, you're, they're reaching their potential, the ones that are there. Yeah. The population will, will jump back. Yeah. Will jump back. And you have to be disciplined. Like, I'm not going to go out there and just shoot does, just shoot does, shoot does. Mm -hmm. You have to be diligent and, you know, stuff like that. But right. that's the flip side of EHD. You're yeah. taking a part of the population out. Yeah. And that way, those deer that are there are healthier. Okay. And everything from the does to the bucks, fawns. you know, the fawns, etc. They're less stressed. They're not competing with themselves. Yeah. for those resources. Yeah. This is an example like to try to visualize for yourself. Would you rather be, what, what flight is more enjoyable for you? A full flight where you're packed in like sardines yeah. 
or you got space to your left and there's you know there's people dotted throughout the plane yeah. but there's space in between which yeah. flight do you enjoy more i like acting like i have ehd on a plane it's <laughs> yeah, just so there's like, nodding and stuff like that yeah, yeah I, I got an image up my nose yeah. no but that is i That's mean to sit there and to make sure you 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 why we brought up ehd is that it's something that you can put something to right you know and that plane example is <laughs> That's probably what we should have done in the first place. <laughs> yeah. But that is it. You're yeah. stressed. And then when you do have room, you get to enjoy those peanuts. Oh, yeah. You're more <laughs> a little bit better, you know, pretzels. Take a little nap. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Absolutely. But, yeah, that's the thing that EHD, we don't like it. We don't want it. But, again, it was an example to show you when you take away a population. And that is replace EHD with harvest Yeah. on your property. Same and that is the same. That's yeah. the, yep. So. so how do I know if I'm shooting enough deer? Off of my property. There's a lot of ways. And let's talk about a couple of them. They're obviously what most of us do, for all honest, is just a visual aspect of things. Sure. Looking at your habitat, seeing if your browse is getting depleted versus you know not. And if you've seen it's stable, that's where you just it's not broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Okay, just keep doing what you're doing. Another thing is a camera survey. And especially this time of year, August, September is when we do, when we conduct those camera surveys. Right. And there's a lot of information out there. You can YouTube it, how to do it. But there's something that we do, and especially if your state allows, you know, harvest after January, mm -hmm. and that is collecting fetuses. Yeah. And simply by doing that, and like, again, it's not for everybody. It's doing a little research, getting, you know, it can, can be a little disgusting. Yeah. But when you harvest that doe after, you know, in that January time period, she does have a fetus in it. Oh. And by collecting that fetus, there is a scale, okay? It's a piece of plastic, got all these numbers and lines on it. You lay that fetus on there. And by doing a simple measurement and a simple math problem, we can tell when that doe was bred. Right. And by doing another math problem, we can tell when that doe was gonna have that fawn. Right. Now, why is that important for both? Let's talk about fall. Why would you think that would be important when that doe was bred at a certain time? We want her to be bred at a certain time, so she's dropping her fawn when there's optimum quality mm -hmm. cover and quality food for that fawn yep. and for the doe, producing yep. the milk for the fawn the following yep. spring. Yeah, and when we have, the last time that we did a fetus, um, fetus research project on my place mm -hmm. you know it was several years ago and we did 10 does now more does the better but we did 10 does and it was november 9th through the 12th 10 does were bred from the 9th through the 12th yeah. that is when you know things are going absolutely swimmingly right the deer are getting the does are getting bred in their first cycle yep. which means a healthier fawn yep. and when when those do, uh, fawns are going to be born uh, toward the end of May, that means, like Cody said, a lot more forage for those does to get mm -hmm. that protein level up. They're right. not stealing from their skeletal system to get those nutrients going on. Right. That fawn is in quality cover. Yeah. That's important, especially for coyotes, etc., domestic dogs, yeah. and etc. So by doing this, and, and by if you if you're just doing a visual, that's great. If you're doing a camera, there's flaws to that too. By doing this extra step, yeah. it will lead you to knowing exactly what is going on in your on your property. Mm -hmm. And the more people you get involved with it, you'll know the community what is going on. And that is so important. That's when the, the numbers don't lie. Yeah. The yeah. numbers don't lie. The tighter that breeding window, the better it is for fawns, yes. for does, and for bucks. I mean, we get excited about that late second rut when bucks are chasing yeah. does in December. In a picture-perfect world, you don't want bucks running themselves ragged looking no. for does in December and January. No. That puts them behind going into winter. Yeah. Going into winter behind means they're coming out of going into spring playing catch-up. Yeah. We want those fawns being bred in as tight a window mm -hmm. as possible, like you mentioned, because those fawns are going to be bred in the same window the following spring yeah. that helps combat predation yep. the following spring because it's kind of a flood the market type of deal absolutely the more like fawns that. on the landscape the harder it is for bears bobcats coyotes whatever you got to yeah. pick them off yeah and it increases your fawn recruitment actually yeah. in in that regard yeah and when we have this scale which you can get through the national deer association mm -hmm. or forestry supply NDA, National Deer Association, has a lot of information on their website where you can learn how to do this. It's quite simple, but yeah. if you need that little help. But 
when you do all these measurements and you notice, like Cody was saying, that, that it's the second rut. It's in the, maybe even to January, depending on where you live, obviously. Right. That's not good. No. That means that we need to harvest more does. Yeah. And not necessarily just the older does, but an uneven age class of white-tailed deer. But so, visual, camera survey, and then doing the next step, which I like to do myself, because it is data, it's true data, sure. and that is a fetus measurement thing. Absolutely. So, we're, we've touched on quite a bit already. Yeah. All that information, when done correctly, and as you're a hunter, and I'm a hunter, mm -hmm. and I'm a deer hunter, you're a deer hunter. Yeah. What's that all have to do with all that? Yeah, we talked about habitat and how it can improve your habitat. We talked about herd health. But a selfish byproduct of it is better hunting. Better hunting. Yeah. Absolutely. Hands down. Absolutely. Better hunting. More enjoyment out there for Absolutely, you. Absolutely. Yeah. A well when you think of your herd, deer herd, when it's properly balanced as a well oiled machine, I mean, yeah, those animals are thriving. Oh. But in the deer stand, I mean you've got better, more enjoyable hunting from the day deer season comes in because they're not stressed, they're not competing for resources, they're moving more freely, a more intense rut. You're seeing more mature bucks during the daylight. Bigger, they, healthier animals. Right, because they're, they're working a little bit harder to look fine does, more vocalizations, those snort wheezes, grunts, all those. Deer are being deer. Yes. And you're enjoying that. And as sportsmen, or as hunters now to, nowadays, yeah. our backpack is full of, it's not like snacks. It's antlers, snort wheezes, grunts, right. bleats, calls. It is. Scents, it's it's like, like it's whatever we can buy at Walmart. Yep. We're gonna shove in that bag, <laughs> right. and we're gonna throw the kitchen sink at them too. Yeah. But like Cody said, all those things. The deer are more vocal. If a buck wants to breed, he has to be on his feet mm -hmm. and doing snort wheezes, doing grunts, doing bleats, all that stuff. That stuff you you know the rattling in in a highly <laughs> populated area yeah what are you doing right. you're just hurting your knuckles that's exactly. all you're doing yeah. but when you have a lot of competition because that's what it leads to yeah. for them and the healthier and what's why we why is that important because the healthier more dominant deer are breeding right. and that's what we want yeah you know so all those toys that we like to buy thinking that's this is the year we're going to do it right you know what and when you rattle a deer actually comes not just like 10 minutes later and you're like, yeah, I rattled one in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you didn't. Yeah, button buck comes <laughs> yeah, yeah. wandering by. But there's there's all that. It makes your hunting better, for, for without sure. a doubt. Absolutely, yeah. I would rather sit in a deer stand, maybe see a few less deer, Absolutely. but have a more enjoyable hunt and see bucks cruising, whether it's you know year and a half and two year olds. They just act stupid. Yeah. Which it's it's fun. Like you like to see them chasing with their nose up, and they don't know yeah. what they're doing. They just know they're supposed to be doing something. Yeah. And then you see those big mature bucks work and scrapes and how methodical they are when they're looking for does. I mean, it's it's exciting. You can actually appreciate the animal more, I think, yes. that way, especially mature bucks yeah. when you see them up on yep. their feet, cruising, looking for does. And yeah. that really only happens in a, in a well, properly balanced deer herd. Absolutely. It just, again, it makes your hunting so much more enjoyable. And also the byproduct of that is you're, you're harvesting healthier, bigger animals, right. does and bucks alike. Absolutely. So if I have a lot of deer to kill off of my property, what are some ways I can get creative to achieve those numbers? Because if it's a lot, it's a lot of killing it for is. one person. In a lot of states, you can only kill so many because of legal, the legality of it and of only getting so many tags. So we have to, like you said, be creative. Right. And how do we do that? <sighs> By doing your homework. Let's go down this rabbit hole. Before the season, do a little research in a sense of what processor, if you do take your deer to a processor, yeah. which ones take donated meat? What do you need to do to do that? Right. Does it cost money? And then there's farmers and hunters feeding the hungry. There's that uh, donation program where a lot of deer processors hook up with them and it, you, all you have to do is just drop off the deer itself. Yeah. And you don't have to pay anything, you know? So, but another thing that we could do is what we should be doing anyway. Right. And what is that? Introducing new hunters, taking somebody new out. Yeah, taking somebody new out. And we always think of kids. Yeah. Adults. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. we can't forget about them. Right. And people that are gone away from the sport, that yeah. don't have a place to, that would love to go back out and try it. Yeah. You know, get those people back into the sport. 
That way it's a managed access onto your property. It, you're using their tags. Sure. So it's a benefit of both worlds. Yeah. You're introducing somebody or bringing them back in. Right. You're taking, if they don't want the meat, it is what it is, people. You can only eat so many deer. Sure. You yeah. don't want to put a deer in a freezer and not utilize it. So we, yeah, absolutely. So you're bringing people in, you're introducing them, you're bringing them back, and then donating the meat. Absolutely. There is a lot of ways that we can harvest these deer ethically yeah. and then the wise use of it afterwards for right. sure right wise use of the resource is an important part we don't want to waste the animal Absolutely. we want to if we are removing them off of the landscape we want to make sure that we're providing where that that animal is still valuable even yeah. after it's dead and donating yeah. to you know hunters for the hungry like you said taking new people out introducing them to the sport incorporating meat into that equation that mm -hmm. they can source their own protein that's that's a big deal yeah. for especially adult on yeah. hunters. And it's like, where do we find these people? Especially, I mean, my son's 19. I try to find a bunch of his friends to take out yeah. and stuff and they, they're just gone. They're gone. <laughs> right. But there are many avenues you can go down if you don't know people to take. You contact your state agency, you yeah. contact them, you let them know. There's a program called R3 that the, throughout the country, bringing people back into sport, introducing people back into the sport and they have a list of people that you can have, Yeah. okay? Your local NDA branch, I'm sure they know people. There's all, your churches, your Boy Scouts, your Girl Scouts, the whole nine yards. Yeah. There is no ceiling on this, Right. for sure. Yeah. But yeah, just utilizing your resource wisely. We can, you can be effective on bringing the population down and being smart about it and for your habitat, all the hard work that you try to do on your property and everything. Everything can be managed. Yeah, the benefits of shooting deer are endless and we kind of touched on a couple different topics. Mm -hmm. We could go into more detail on each one really, yeah. but to make it personal, when I tell people who are familiar with me and know how much I do care about the white-tailed deer, it's like, well, how can you go out and kill them? Mm -hmm. I tell them it's, it's not that I don't care about that white-tailed deer that I just shot, I care a great deal, mm -hmm. but I care about the white-tailed deer mm -hmm. as a whole, the species. You have to look Love at it. the species as a whole and not get so concentrated mm -hmm. on an individual animal because you are, yeah. you're doing the species a favor and the process is backwards as it may sound. Oh yeah, and when we go out this year, just so you you don't fall trap and like oh I'll shoot her I'll shoot I'll shoot a doe later I'll shoot a doe later because a buck might come just shoot them early yeah <laughs> get it out of the way right. unless you're going to do a feed a study then you can you know depending on where you live obviously if it goes into January save a couple tags for that sure. or just go into it but shoot them early when you go out there make that sound decision I am going to harvest a doe tonight yeah no matter ifs ands or buts about it I am going to shoot a doe tonight. That way it does get done. Yeah. You know, because I know we're all out there waiting for Mr. Big Mike to be coming out. Mm -hmm. Cody, in Cody's case, it's not. It really <laughs> isn't. Just shoot a doe, Cody. Yeah. But yeah, it's, I mean, just go out there and make sure, I mean, we, we didn't talk a lot about it, but shoot an uneven age class of deer. Yeah. We'll cross that rabbit hole another day. Yeah. But just go out there, have fun. Yeah. And just as it is for us, I'm sure it is for you, wildlife is our way of life.